I should call him, I suppose, Dr. Vishurin, but I know him and have had, I, I don't think I've met face uh, in person, but we've had many uh, discussions by email over the years. So I, I'm going to refer to him as Jerry, if people don't mind. It, it, it's it's uh, easier to say that. Uh, so there's much in um, Jerry's book, um, A Beautiful Mind. I think it's called A Beautiful Mind and Soul. There's much in the book that uh, one could discuss. Um, there's a, just a lot of interesting content. And, um, and one could talk about it for days, but I only have, well, 10 minutes. And maybe if I have to stretch it out, I, I, but even if I only have uh, 20 or 30 minutes, um, I'm going to have to just pick out a few somewhat random points to, to discuss. One of the things I like about Jerry's books, uh, he's written quite a few of them on science and faith, is that they're full of wonderful quotes um, from eminent scientists and philosophers that I'd never seen before, the quotes I'd never seen before, and that he deploys with great effect uh, to support his positions and to uh, uh, illustrate the errors that he's attacking. And uh, these alone are worth the price of admission. Um, at, at some point, I'd like to sit down with a stack of Jerry's books and just cull out um, from them all of these uh, marvelous quotes that, he's, uh, that he has and to use them in my own talks and articles. Uh, now, as far as the substance of the book, uh, the, his book is um, basically the main themes of his book are uh, scientific, uh, scientistic reductionism scientism, and on the one hand, and uh, a defense of the reality of the human spiritual soul, on the other hand. He de he's de the book is about the soul and defending the reality of the spiritual soul against materialist reductionism. Now, uh, I am in fundamental agreement with uh, the main positions uh, that being defended in his book. And, um, and in fact, I agree with almost all of his analyses and arguments. Um, there are a few things in the book on which I see things differently. And I wish you were here right now, because then maybe that would provoke a discussion later. Uh, but they have to do with matters that are not central to the book. For example, I'm not convinced that science um, uh, could not have arisen uh, except within the matrix of a Christian or at least theistic culture. Uh, that's a point that uh, uh, Stanley Yockey makes and, and uh, Jerry makes it in his book that, that, that Christianity was a necessary precondition for the rise and development of modern science. And I, I'm skeptical. It's certainly is conducive, uh, the Christian belief is conducive to the pursuit of science, and it did play a positive role and contributed to the rise and development of science. Whether, whether you know, hypothetically, it is a necessary condition, I, I, I'm not convinced. Um, I think science could see, conceivably could have developed in the absence of Christianity. So, but that's a, a relatively minor point in the book. Uh, another thing that um, I would probably disagree with uh, Jerry on is uh, that I don't think uh, that science, modern science, relies on religious ideas for its fundamental assumptions. He, he makes that claim in the book that even today, um, the science continues to rely on Christian ideas uh, to justify its fundamental assumptions. And I'm not sure that that's true. For example, uh, it's, um, it, what, among the fundamental assumptions of modern science, which Jerry mentions, are uh, the, 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 that the world is orderly and also that it's comprehensible. Now, it is certainly true that we believe as Christians that the reason the world is orderly and comprehensible is that it was the product of divine reason that God uh, created it. Uh, but I think in the order of human knowledge, things go in the other direction. That is, I think we first know, in most cases, we first know that the world is orderly and comprehensible by seeing that order and by actually understanding things about the world. And it, from that, which we know first, that it's orderly and comprehensible, we argue, too, the existence of God. 
And so I think the things are in the other. At the level of causation, is God causes the order and, and, and intelligibility of the world. But at the level of our knowledge, we first know that the world is orderly and intelligible, and we reason from that to the existence of God. But anyway, again, these are not fundamental. Uh, these are somewhat off the main stream of his book. Of his, uh... So let me talk to... Um, uh, let, me, let me discuss the main uh, topics of this book. Uh, and as I say, when it comes to the main themes of reductionism and the reality of the human spiritual soul, I'm in wholehearted agreement with virtually everything he says in the book. So let me just pick one, one or two things that I particularly appreciate, since I can't discuss everything. Uh, one thing I particularly appreciate in this book is that Jerry correctly diagnoses the causes of scientism and reductionism. Being a scientist himself, he understands where the boundary between science itself and scientism really lies. And he also understands the difference between reduction as used in modern science which is not a bad thing in general, and reductionism. He understands the distinction and explains it very well. Uh, and these are things that some Catholic writers and other religious writers sometimes get wrong. Some authors take aim at scientism and they end up hitting science. So consider reductionism. There are some authors who think that the approach that characterizes much of modern science of understanding physical objects and systems by analyzing them in terms of their constituent parts inevitably yields a distorted picture of reality. They repeat the well-known aphorism that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And they believe that modern science does reduce things just to the sums of their parts and is therefore inherently a reductionistic enterprise in the bad sense. And so they actually attack science itself and its methods as yielding a false picture, of a distorted picture. Now, this is not true. And Jerry explains uh, in, his, this, in his book very well. I want to quote directly from a passage that I particularly like, where he uh, is a customarily lucid passage in his book. So, quote, and that, there's some ellipses. I am cutting out some text in the middle, but, quote, there has been quite some confusion on this issue. On the one hand, there seems to be something hidden in the whole that the parts do not have. On the other hand, we do not know what that something would be. The answer to the problem can be found in the distinction between substances, properties, and relationships, which you discussed pretty earlier. The question of how we should take this more, beyond, uh, more, when you say the whole is more than the sum of its parts, the question of how, is how we should take this more that is considered to be hidden. If we take it as another substance with properties, we get into trouble. That happened, for example, when some life scientists in the past um, uh, introduced a mysterious substance, the so-called life force, to explain why living things are alive. What these people did not realize is that the parts of the whole, of a whole, also have a certain relationship to each other. Taking the whole apart destroys what we had before by breaking the relationships between the parts. So what Jerry is saying here is that one is only left with a sum of parts, or let's say just a set of parts, if one ignores all the relationships among the parts in the whole. And science is not guilty of this. 
Only someone who does not really understand how modern science operates thinks that science does do this. Science analyzes, modern science analyzes things in terms of their constituent parts and their relationships to each other in the, within the whole. And that is entirely proper. And rather than distorting reality, it is generally necessary to understanding reality correctly. That proper kind of reduction, which is done within science, is not the culprit in, in, in producing the bad kind of reductionism. As Jerry explains, the real mistake that leads to reductionism is a taking a further step which goes beyond science of saying that the parts and their relationships in the whole are all there is there to the whole. There is nothing but those parts and their relationships. Nothing but. And as he quotes, people often talk about nothing buttery. Now, I don't know. I wish you were here so he could uh, agree or disagree. With us. So consider, for example, now to say that there's nothing but, uh, when talking about some object or system, that there's nothing but the parts and their relationships within the whole is sometimes valid and sometimes is not valid. It's not always bad. Sometimes it's okay. So uh, it, my own view is if we're talking about an inanimate object, like a lump of coal or a piece of copper or a glass of water, uh, I would say that talking about the parts, the atoms and so forth, and their relationships among each other, Actually, I think there's nothing wrong, personally, or I, I, I'm not convinced that there's anything wrong with saying there's nothing, nothing more to the glass of water or the lump of coal, nothing but the constituent parts and their relationships. One could debate that. I, I'm not convinced that there's anything wrong in that case with nothing buttery. But when it comes to, say, a cat or a dog... I would say, and, I, and Jerry, I know, would agree with this, to say there's nothing to a dog beyond the parts, the constituent parts and their relationships to each other, the, the physical constituents and their physical relationships, that is uh, reductionistic and, and wrong. Because, for example, the dog has consciousness. And I would argue, and I suspect Jerry would agree, that consciousness cannot be understood simply by an analysis of these atoms and their, and their interactions and relationships. There's something more there. Um, and, and, and to uh, say nothing but uh, the parts in their relationships is, is, uh, is reductionistic and wrong. So anyway, um, so I, I, I really appreciate that part of his book because, as I said, a lot of writers uh, falsely mistake, uh, they mistake the, the proper reduction that goes on in the physical sciences, which is, which is uh, with reductionism. Uh, so let me use an analogy that's not in Jerry's book uh, to, to those who, who still might be uh, uh, worried about reduction uh, and analyzing things into their parts. Suppose we were talking about understanding a passage of uh, a piece of te uh, text. Uh, uh, well, there's no way to understand it properly without, so that what the text is made up of paragraphs, which are made up of sentences, which are made up of letters. Those are the parts. Now, it's true that if one just had, the, that the text is more than the sum of those parts. If we just had, you know, fragmented the text into its constituent words and, and just sort of wrote all here, listed, gave an, an inventory of the words of the text, breaking the relationships among them and just fragmenting them into the constituent parts. Then you have nothing, they, they don't have a text anymore. You don't, it, it, to understand the text, you have to understand the words indeed, 
and their relationships. And so you have to understand how the words are arranged and fit together uh, according to the rules of syntax and grammar. You have to understand the role of prepositions and conjunctions and relative pronouns and subordinate clauses and prepositional phrases and all that kind of thing. You have to understand the structure and how the parts relate to each other within the sentence and how the sentences are related to other sentences and so on. That's the reduction that science does, analogous to the reduction. You you look at the parts and their relationships to understand the whole. And it would be madness to say that you could understand the text in any other way. That's a necessary thing. I mean, uh, I think all of us who have written articles are sometimes amazed that we have letters to the editor or emails addressed to us personally, reacting to things we've written, which show that the person does has no, completely misinterpreted what we said. And, and often it's clear they did it because they were sort of just had some gestalt, you know, holistic view of what we wrote, but did not pay close attention to the parts of the sentences and how they, the, the, the detailed structure of the sentences. They, you have to, you have to do that kind of reduction in order to understand things. Um, so, uh, it's, and so I think that's a clear case of this. There's nothing wrong with, 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 with analyzing holes in terms of their parts and their relationships. Now, the, the, the example of the text also shows, uh, where you can have, um, reductionism, uh, because there's more to the text. The text is an example of where there's more to it than just the constituent words and their grammatical and syntactical relationship. Because you could take Google Translate or some other program, and it could read a passage. I often take a passage, say, of French. I don't know any French at all. So I, if I, there's a passage in, some, in French, I will copy and paste it into Google Translate, and it will produce, amazingly enough, a well-written grammatical English translation of it. And it can do that. And the only way it can do that is because it knows the words. It it, it it understands, in quotes, the words and their syntactical and grammatical relationships. It, It knows how English sentences are constructed and how French sentences are constructed. And it knows how the words, how the parts in English are related to the parts in French and how the, and so on, and it can, but what doesn't the Google Translate know? It doesn't have any idea of the meanings of the text. It can translate, but it has no idea of the meaning. It doesn't understand the French text any more than I do. And that's because there's a layer, a, a, a level that goes beyond the mere parts and their grammatical and syntactical relationships. There's the semantic level, the level of meaning. And so there's an example is if somebody were to say, there's nothing to this text other than the words and their grammatical and syntactical relationships. Uh, they, that would be nothing buttery. And uh, it would be wrong. It would be overlooking the higher level of under, uh, which is given to us by meaning. And, um, and so um, anyway, so I'm, I'm just trying to illustrate that reduction is necessary in many cases, but it's sometimes inadequate. And so the rest of his book um, is talking, of, is defending the idea that there's more to human beings uh, than physics and biology and chemistry can explain, more to us than atoms related to each other and interacting in certain ways. And, and in particular, we have a spiritual soul. 